going to get used to that. Reading uh, from Psalm 31. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be with you this morning on this Lord's Day. Great to see uh, so many of you here in person. It seems like we are uh, getting more and more people out, and that's wonderful. So let's begin our worship this morning uh, with the singing of a hymn. Doesn't my wife's hair look amazing this morning? I am uh, proud to say I did it again, did the uh, coloring job. I'm getting better, so <laughs> if anyone needs help, any men you need help, I can kind of walk you through it. Uh, this is the time I usually do the announcements. There just aren't many announcements uh, to give this morning. Uh, most of the classes, obviously, we're not having, but I do understand uh, we are working towards how to get back to uh, having Sunday school classes and things like that, so that's an exciting development. Uh, if you're here, you registered, so we appreciate everyone uh, registering to come this morning. Uh, another announcement, obviously, if you can help in the nursery, uh, please reach out to Sarah and let her know. Uh, the last announcement, this one pains me. It's very uh, difficult to give this announcement. I see Jeff cringing. The family camp has been canceled, and that is a result of Pine Cove actually contacting us. I know what you're thinking. We gave Jeff one thing to do. <laughs> just one job. Just book Pine Cove. Uh, but no, un unfortunately, it's a, a result of the kind of pandemic we're going through. They're having challenges, and they didn't feel it was the right time to open the camp up. So there will be no family camp this year. Hopefully, we'll be back uh, next year. So uh, with that, we are starting a new study this morning. And so now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth, and good morning. And it is good to see the numbers creeping up a bit uh, each Sunday. I think maybe we may even be uh, raising the number of people that can, uh, can come in the next week or two. But good to see you all here. And those of you who are out there, good morning. We are studying a, starting a new series this morning in 2 Thessalonians. And so our text is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I'll read through it as we always do on a Sunday morning, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. Silvanus is Silas. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. When he says God's righteous judgment here, he's speaking of his righteous approval, his assessment and approval and acceptance of them, which is proven by their endurance in the midst of great difficulty. But we'll talk about that as we come to it in the, uh, in the lesson. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and, and bless our time now together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to be with your people on a Sunday morning, and it is um, a welcome sight to come here and see the numbers increasing a bit. And uh, Lord, as we gather here, we pray your protection upon us, 
We pray that uh, you would bless our health, and we pray this every Sunday as we consider the circumstances, this pandemic, and pray that you would protect us, keep us safe, keep us wise in our conduct, but keep us safe and keep the, uh, uh, the, the health of each one of us, preserve it. We live and we move and we exist in you, as Paul told the philosophers of Athens. And every breath of life that we take is a gift from you. And you are in control of everything. Isaiah speaks of how you call out the stars and you name them each. And as we think about the abundance of the stars, the innumerable number of them, it's a way of saying you control everything. From the greatest spheres in the universe to the smallest microbes. And so you're in control of everything. Everything that enters our space and enters into our our lungs and our bodies, you control it. And so, Lord, we can rest confidently in you. We're to live wisely and responsibly, but we can trust you to bless us. And we pray for that. Bless us physically. And I think of others, Lord. We've mentioned names throughout the weeks, but pray for those whose health has been compromised through uh, various conditions and procedures. But we think of them. I Pray for Madeline, that you would bless her, and Audrey, and Margaret, and Betty, and others, Lord, whose names aren't mentioned. There are some in our congregation who have experienced protracted illnesses and have gone through numerous procedures and still suffer the problems that they have. And I pray that you would bless them with patience with endurance like these Thessalonians were experiencing and exercising. And may they sense your presence and may they experience the patience that only you can give them. And as we <clears throat> consider the text that we are looking at this morning, we are reminded that it is all of you. And so, Lord, we look to you to bless those who are, are in particular need, but bless all of us. Bless all of us with perseverance and a good witness. That's certainly what we learn uh, of as our need and our responsibility from our text. So bless us spiritually, Lord. Bless us physically. Bless us in every way. And uh, we pray that you would uh, bless us in particular now as we turn our attention to the Scriptures and that you would build us up in the faith. Bless our nation in this time of crisis. Bless our leaders with wisdom. Uh, we pray that you would bless us through all of this. And through all of this, Lord, awaken people to the understanding that the great problems we face are not physical. They're not matters of health. They're matters of the soul. They're spiritual. And I pray that you would bring about a, an awakening within the hearts of men and women throughout this land, of their, of their need of you, their need of the Savior, and that you might bring them to faith and use us to that end, we pray. We pray that all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> One of the most remarkable accounts in the Bible is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three young Hebrews who were thrown into a fiery furnace for their faith. It's in Daniel chapter 3. Every Bible-believing Christian knows it is a true story. And so can't help wondering how those three young men were able to do that, where they got the courage. And you can't help but wonder, could I do that? Well, the answer to the question how they did that is given in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, where Paul recounts a similar situation and how the saints persevered through persecution and affliction. In a word, the answer is faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. 
And the Christians of Thessalonica were especially exemplary in doing that. That's our passage. But since this is the beginning of a new series in 2 Thessalonians, let's begin with a few words of introduction. Paul first visited the city of Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. After establishing a church in Philippi, Paul and his companions, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, went south to Thessalonica, the largest city in Macedonia. They visited synagogue, and again, the Lord blessed the gospel, and another small church was established, made up of Jews and Greeks from the city. According to Acts 17, Paul was there for three Sabbaths, so a little over two weeks, maybe three weeks, not long. But in that time, Paul and Silas taught them basic Bible doctrine before being driven out of town by the men of the synagogue. So again, they went south, first to Berea, where again they established a church before the Jews of Thessalonica arrived and forced them to leave there. Silas and Timothy went back to Thessalonica to check on the church while Paul went down to Athens and then to Corinth where later they were all reunited. But it was there in Corinth that Paul learned from Silas and Timothy that some in the young church in Thessalonica had died and others were facing some hard opposition for their faith. So he wrote a letter to the church, the book of 1 Thessalonians, to console them in their grief and encourage them in their struggle. In chapter 4, he reminded them that death is temporary. Christ is coming for us. When He does, the dead will be raised and the living will be raptured, and so we will always be with the Lord. What is clear from both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is that during the two or three weeks that Paul was with them, he taught the Thessalonian Christians a lot of eschatology, prophetic events. In chapter 5, he wrote that they knew about the times and epochs, future events, and the day of the Lord, what it was, and how it would occur. The, it is a day of judgment, and it will happen suddenly. These are some of the doctrines Paul taught them. Still, just in just three weeks, the apostle could only have given them a, um, a general outline of the, uh, the subjects that he taught. And so, when the messenger returned from delivering the, uh, the letter, 1 Thessalonians, to them, maybe it was Timothy, probably it was Timothy who had done that, he told Paul of the present problems that the church was having. They were still suffering persecution and were dealing with some doctrinal confusion. A teacher had come there, or maybe a letter had been sent to them saying that they were already in the day of the Lord. Well, it affected their behavior. The end was near, so why work? So Paul quickly wrote a second letter explaining in some detail the day of the Lord, that it had not come, and what the signs of it would be. That's a big part of 2 Thessalonians, but not all of the book. Paul also comforted them in their persecution and corrected some of them for an undisciplined and lazy life. If anyone is not willing to work, he wrote, then he is not to eat either. So there's a lot of down-to-earth practical instruction here, as well as some of the most fascinating prophetic revelation in the Bible. And that, too, is completely practical. It begins in almost um, the identical way his first letter to them began, and follows the basic form of most of Paul's letters with an introduction and thanksgiving. 
Basically, all of his letters follow the conventional form of correspondence in the first century. Yeah, but it wasn't just a standard form of writing. It was always meaningful. That is, when Paul wrote an introduction and a greeting. We see that in, in the first verse. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word our in our Father is not in the greeting of 1 Thessalonians. Paul put it here for a reason. The persecution had continued and the Thessalonians needed this reminder. God the Father... The eternal Father of the eternal Son is also our Father. Father of Paul, Father of the Thessalonians, Father of us. He cared for them in that very difficult and trying time as a father cares for his children. They would not be able to make it through the trial as we will not make it through life's hardships without fixing our minds on that very fact that God the Father is our Father personally. Every one of us will have what the old Scottish minister Thomas Boston called a crook in the lot. A crook being an unforeseen trouble or trial and the lot being one's life. So one's lot in life. We will have some difficulty in life. It may not be persecution like these Thessalonians were experiencing. It may be an issue of our health or a financial setback, but we will have a crook in the lot. Thomas Boston did. When he was a child, his father was in prison for his faith. Later, as a minister, Boston's wife suffered physical and mental problems. And he and she buried six of their ten children. So he knew of what he wrote and preached. And the first step, or what he calls the remedy for affliction, hardship, so that we will endure it well and not be crushed by it, is to consider the Lord. He is the one who put the crook in the life. And it is never without purpose. We may not see the reason, but we are to look to Him. We are to consider Him well and know the trouble is there for our good. Now that is faith. It is knowing that God is good, that God is wise and loves us like a, a father loves his child. Only He can remove the crook in that lot. So we're to look to Him. And look to Him as the one who cares for us. Paul was saying the same thing here in verse 1 with that little word, our. He will recount their persecution. But here he is reminding the Thessalonians that through it all, God is their loving Father. All of that to say that the introductions to Paul's letters were not formal or thoughtless. They were meaningful. And we see that in the next verse where Paul wishes or prays for them to have grace and peace. That's the blessing that enables us to persevere in faith and do so through the most difficult trials of life. And Paul makes it clear that it doesn't come from us. Not something that we gin up within ourselves. The origin of both grace and peace is divine. It's from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Both, along with the Holy Spirit, who is mentioned later in chapter 2, are the source of this life-transforming grace and the peace that it produces in the midst of trials. Every word in this two-verse greeting is meaningful. 
It, it gives the basis and reason for the lives of the Thessalonians that Paul goes on to praise in the next verses. The fact that God is the Father of each of the Thessalonian believers and also indicates that they are all children in the same family and should care for one another as children of the same family, members of the same household. And they did. Paul gives thanks for that in verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Paul's use of ought here suggests that he felt an obligation to give thanks for their growth in faith and their love for the saints. Their response and behavior in such hard times made it right to do that. There were problems in the church, that's why Paul wrote the letter, and he would get to that later, a problem of idleness, as I have already mentioned. But typical of Paul, he begins with encouragement, not correction. And there was a lot to be encouraged about. Their faith was greatly enlarged. In fact, that can be translated, growing wonderfully. It's a present tense, so it's in the process of doing that. It is in the process of, uh, a process of continually increasing. Faith is Godward. It is in the Lord and in His promises. So Paul's greeting only confirmed what they already knew and had been taught by the apostle that God is their Father. This wasn't a new thing that they're learning. They trusted in Him. They trusted in His Word. And of course, that's the reason their faith increased. They were men and women of the Word of God. They studied Scripture and they believed it. That's the primary way that faith grows in the child of God. And as faith enlarges, love grows. Think I think that you see that, that suggested here from the order of the words as Paul places them together. First faith, and then he mentions love. And here it's love for fellow believers. It, it was growing ever greater because of their faith. All of this encouraged the apostle. The work that he had hastily left when he and the others were forced to leave Thessalonica, had not floundered, but flourished. Their love for the saints was greater than ever. Their faith was expanding. He, he was encouraged by that, and he wanted them to be encouraged by that. It was an evidence of the work of God in their lives. But there was more. In verse 4, he added to their love and faith, praise for their perseverance. And again, he speaks of their faith, which they practiced in very hard times, very challenging circumstances. In fact, Paul said that he and those with him boasted about them among the other churches for their perseverance and faith in the midst of all their persecutions and afflictions. In the midst of all of that, they endured, he says. Perseverance is enduring. Perseverance is steadfastness. Leon Morris commented on this, describing it as an active, manly quality rather than a passive resignation. Well, it is active. It's not passive. And it may be manly, but it included females among them, because there were many in that church. Luke wrote in Acts 17 and verse 4 that a number of the leading women of the city joined Paul and the others. And the point is, all the believers, men and women alike, were actively engaged in perseverance, striving to remain true to the Lord, to be 
obedient, to be a witness in the midst of that city and the midst of all that turmoil. They put out effort in the midst of great trials. And that was due to their faith. That's indicated by the close connection Paul makes between perseverance and faith. There is a cause-effect relationship. Their perseverance is the fruit of their faith. Faith is believing. It is trust. It is relying on the Lord's faithfulness to us in everything. That enables us to persevere in the midst of hard times. To do that, we need to know Him. Calvin paraphrased Paul's words in this way. We glory in your patience which arises from faith and we bear witness that it is prominent in you. He then goes on to explain that there is nothing that sustains us in tribulation as faith does. That's a clear, that, 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 that is clear from the fact that uh, when we stop being aware of God's promises, Calvin says, we completely fail. Faith always has an object. It is in something. It is in the Lord and it is in His Word. So it is vitally important that we know and understand Him, His person and work, His attributes, His character, and His promises. That is what accounts for the courage of the three Hebrews in Daniel chapter 3. They knew the Lord. And that, that gave them the faith to refuse to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's gold image and suffer the consequences as a result. And you hear that in their response to the king. He was willing to give them a second chance, which seems magnanimous for Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone bowed at the sound of the trumpet, except these three. And yet, he gave them a second chance, but they answered, in effect, don't bother. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But even if He does not, let it be known to you, O King, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the gold image that you have set up. They knew there is only one God. In an age of many gods, they knew that it was the Lord God who was God. The God of Israel is the only God. He is sovereign over all of life and its circumstances, and He is able to deliver His people from any situation. Nothing is too difficult for Him. But we can't know what His decretive will is. We can't know His secret will. He may not stop an execution. He may not prevent them from being cast into a fiery furnace. He may not prevent a martyrdom. He knows best. His will is never frustrated. And sometimes it is difficult for us. But it's always wise. His will is always right. All of that, the knowledge of that, the conviction of that gave them courage. John Calvin put it well, faith sustains us, but faith is in God's promises. It is in Him who is able to keep His promises, and it's in His promises. We must be aware of them, or as Calvin put it, we completely fail. Some months ago, there was an interview in the paper with Andrew Brunson. Some of you will remember him. He was the Presbyterian missionary who was a, a arrested by Turkish authorities and put in jail. He was accused of being in cahoots with terrorists and rebels. Everyone knew it was false. But still, he languished in a squalid Turkish jail for months. He lost weight and soon began to lose hope. The real crisis came, he said, 
when he had the feeling of being abandoned by God. He said, I expected a supernatural sense of God's presence. And when I didn't get that, it really shook me. Things only turned around for him when he thought, wait, I need to fight for my faith. That, those are his words. And so he began to focus on enduring and being faithful to God. He was finally released, but only by the, uh, after the American government put strong pressure on Turkey. But I thought it was telling that his crisis came when he didn't get a supernatural sense of God's presence. Now, we would all want that if we were in that kind of circumstance, which is hard to imagine how difficult that must have been. We would want some kind of sense of God's presence. We would want this, um, this uh, reassurance, uh, this feeling, and, and maybe even we would expect it. We'd certainly hope for it. But the fact is, that is not promised. What is promised is he will never abandon us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. That is true whether we have a sense of it or not. The, the question is, are we going to believe it? Are we going to believe God's word, his promises, and act on his promises? Are we going to rely on his faithfulness? We need to ask ourselves, what do we know about him? The Holy Spirit is the permanent seal on our hearts. Permanent. Unto the day of redemption. Christ is the good shepherd who doesn't flee, but lays down his life for the sheep. And God is our Father. The triune God never abandons his children. We know this because the scriptures reveal it. And we understand it, we know it to be true by faith. That's how we live, by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, not by feelings or signs. We'd all love to have signs and wonders. Well, we've had those. God gave those in abundance in the first century. He gave those to His people, and we are His people. We are generations and generations of His people, but we are considered His child, His son, His bride. We are as one people, and we can look at the beginning and say, He's given the signs, He's shown the wonders. And it's revealed, and we know it by trusting in the Word of God. That's what we're to do. Not, not, not lean upon feelings or anything else. Trust only in His Word. Sometimes the test comes when God's Word and promises are before us, but the sense of it isn't. The feelings aren't in us. Are we still going to trust in the Lord as the one who is faithful? That's what will enable us to persevere, to be steadfast in hard times. When it is dark and mundane, faith in God's promises. It was by faith that uh, Pastor Brunson began to endure and remain faithful. It was the same for these ancient Christians in Thessalonica. They lived by faith in, in the person and promises of the triune God and did so in very hard times. Paul wrote that they endured all persecutions and afflictions. Now we can only guess what that involved ostracism, certainly. They were cut off from former friends. Imprisonment, perhaps, in a gloomy, fetid jail. Maybe death, martyrdom. In Lystra, on his first missionary journey, Paul was dragged outside the city, stoned and left for dead. The next day, he told the young church in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
Paul had written something similar to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, that we have been destined for this, for these afflictions. And while that is the, the very thing that we want to avoid, pain, suffering, sorrow, the crook in the lot, still it comes our way and it is used by God for our good, whether we understand how it is used or not. What is clear here is afflictions, tribulations for the Christian are not unusual in a fallen world. So our faith is to be lived out in what Leon Morris described as the fires of trouble and in the furnace of affliction. And often it is in such hard places that our faith is fashioned and matured. So, there is a purpose in it. That doesn't make affliction easy and that doesn't guarantee that we will respond well to our afflictions, but knowing that it is in God's hands, as we understand that, as we believe that, will help us to endure it. And Paul gives the purpose of it for the Thessalonians in verse 5. Their per perseverance was a plain indication that it was, it was evidence of God's righteous judgment, which is His that he considered them worthy of his kingdom, the kingdom of God. Nothing happens by chance. Certainly not their persecutions and afflictions. And by their brave endurance and faithfulness in them, they demonstrated their justification. They demonstrated their adoption into God's family. For the Thessalonians, that was very practical. It, it gave assurance of salvation and not reason to doubt it. That would only encourage greater faith and endurance. And no wonder the Apostle Paul boasted about them. But, and this is important, none of this suggests they merited approval by their own ability. Not at all. Their steadfastness was proof God was working in them. That's the reason for encouragement to them. And He was giving to them every good thing. That explains what they were doing. They had love for the saints, growing faith and perseverance and persecution. But nowhere in this passage did Paul give thanks to them for that. He thanked the Lord. Verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren. He is altogether the source of all that they were experiencing, all of their blessings. That's the reason the apostle thanked God and not the Thessalonians. Salvation is all His work, not ours. And we think of that, we think of justification, being saved, but also the Christian life. Sanctification is all of God. Growing in faith and love and perseverance is just as much God's sovereign work as bringing us out of death into life. We, we cannot take credit for any of it and must always look to Him for it, for everything in our life. The author of Hebrews talks about running the race in chapter 12 and keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. That's how we live our life, looking to Him. What this passage does is bring out our responsibility to love one another, increase in faith, and persevere through hard times. But we can only do that by God's sovereign, powerful grace. That's what Paul would write later to the Thessalonians' neighbors in Philippi when he told them in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. So work. Bring out into the open the, the new life that God has given you. Let it flourish. And you can do that 
Because God is at work in you to cause it to happen. This is a statement of God's sovereign grace. God is the initiator in it and the energizer of it. It has to be that way. We were all, by nature, dead in our trespasses and sins. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Read the whole chapter. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Unwilling to obey. Unable to obey. We were like a dead tree. But the Lord made the tree good so that the tree could bear fruit and the fruit will be good. That is the saint. That is the Christian because that is the power of God's creative grace. It is a work within each of us through the Holy Spirit. He enables us. He energizes us so that we work. We want to work as new creatures in Christ. That's our new God-given desire to be fruitful people, to be active people in obedience. And He gives the impetus for that, the, the push and energy so that we respond with effort and obedience toward righteousness. Now that involves effort on our part. As Philippians 2 indicates, and the Ephesians put forth a lot of effort. That's, that's what Paul commended here. But the effort is a struggle. That's the Christian life. Moment by moment struggle. There is no super Christian who lives on a higher plane where the spiritual life is easy and victory effortless. That's not the Christian life. It is a war. It is a battle, and it has setbacks. My reference earlier to Mr. Brunson wasn't a criticism of him. I don't think I would have fared any better in a Turkish jail than he did. Nevertheless, while we fail, we do go forward in the faith, believing the Lord is sovereign, that He has designed life's difficulties to work for us while He is always with us, never abandoning us, and will always supply us all that we need. Maybe even a supernatural sense of His presence. Maybe He'll give us that feeling. Someday... It will all end triumphantly in the kingdom of God where the Lord will reward our faithfulness even though it will be faithfulness that He produced in us by His sovereign grace. He rewards it. That's the goal. That is what our lives in Christ are moving toward. Christ has obtained our access to the kingdom of God. He has obtained our right to be there. And through faith in Him and being joined to Him, we do have the absolute right to be there. We are His children, His heirs. And now, in the meantime, we are striving for that kingdom. We are fighting on behalf of it. The very mention of the kingdom here in verse 5 gives incentive to fight and live well, to persevere in the difficulties of life. Whatever we sacrifice today, can't compare to what we will be gain, given and what we will gain tomorrow and what we will have forever. God is no man's debtor. And whatever we give up for Him, whatever is taken from us through our faithfulness, He will more than make up for and make up for with something infinitely greater than we lost and something that we will have forever. So, to do that to be faithful. By God's grace, we need to enlarge our faith so that we will endure when our faith is in the furnace of affliction. We do that by, by learning of the Lord, 
by learning about Him and praying for His grace. That equips us for the challenges today and those that may be coming. There will be challenges coming for all of us. And so this is how we prepare, prepare for them. Well, may the Lord help us to do that. To see the urgency of grounding our lives in the knowledge of the Lord God. Nothing will, will get us through the trials of life like that. Like knowing the Lord and His promises and His faithfulness and resting in that. But that's for the Christian. If anyone is here or watching who has not believed in Christ as Lord of the universe and Savior of the world, then you are lost, not headed for the kingdom of God, but for eternal judgment. Realize that is true. Turn from unbelief. Trust in Christ and His sacrifice for sinners. He bore the penalty for all who believe in Him and who by faith lay hold of that payment that He made in His own blood on the cross. At that moment, that very moment, He forgives the believer and counts him or her righteous, justified. He gives eternal life now and life that is in the glorious kingdom to come forever. May God help you to do that and help all of us. And I trust all of you have done that. I hope so. We'll continue to persevere by placing your faith constantly in Him and resting in His promises. May God help us to do that. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. And as we do, I'm going to ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, which we will take in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for this brief introduction uh, to 2 Thessalonians that the Apostle gave and all that's contained in it. The encouragement that they give us as we look at their life lived out in the, the, the crucible of affliction, persecution and affliction, great trials, and yet they, may, they remain faithful to you, increased in their faith toward you and their love for one another. And so often it's during tri times of trial that we are joined together in a closer relationship to one another and your family. And we're given opportunities to help one another. And they did that. They're a great example to us. And we pray that we would emulate their example. But what we learn here, even more basically, is you're the source of all of that. You're the source of grace and peace. And you give it to your people. And we are to walk by faith. And as we walk by faith, we will experience that. It may take us through difficulties, but we will experience your faithfulness. You will not abandon us. We thank you and praise you for that. And we, we turn in our thoughts now to the cross and remembering what the Lord did to gain all of that for us. We we can have the assurance of our salvation and our place in the kingdom of God, of the eternal glorious future that we have as we understand firmly what Christ did in purchasing us at Calvary and gaining for us eternal life, suffering in our place. He saved us at the cross and the Spirit of God applied all of that to us in our time. We thank you for that. Now help us, Father, as we uh, come to this very important moment of remembering Christ in the taking of the Lord's Supper, to, to do that, to remember Him and be encouraged and built up in the faith. We thank you for Him. We thank you for your Son, whom you sent into the world to die for us and for His willingness to come for us. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Before we observe now the Lord's Supper, I want to read a few verses out of the fifth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans, a familiar passage beginning in verse 8 of Romans chapter 5. 
But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. What I want to say now very briefly uh, is that there are four observations that we can make from these verses that will help set our minds aright as we partake of the bread and the wine. The first is God's love. When God's Son uh, became a man, uh, entered into our world, uh, lived a sinless life entirely in submission to the will of his Father, and as Paul uh, writes here in verse 8, died for us, that was the definitive demonstration of the love of God for us. If you ever doubt that God loves you, if you're here today, uh, weighed down by your personal failures in serving the Lord and being faithful to Him, or your circumstances perhaps have made it difficult for you to sense the love of God in your life, and yet you have trusted in Christ and you believe that you belong to Him because He died for you, then as you take of this bread and of this cup, uh, you are remembering the love of God for you. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The second thing to notice, and it's closely connected to the first, is that in dying for our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us by justifying us. Dan mentioned that. Paul says, much more, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Uh, here is the judicial side of things. Uh, the legal declaration that you have been declared not guilty on account of our Lord Jesus Christ had been taken the punishment for our sin and our guilt upon himself, uh, erasing the holy charge against us and by virtue of the satisfaction that Jesus rendered on our behalf, uh, moving the Lord God to credit his perfect righteousness to us. We are righteous in the eyes of God because he sees not our sin and guilt, but the perfect justification accomplished by Christ. The third observation is that consequently we have true hope. The apostle boldly declares, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Our hope is not tied to worldly goods or worldly ties or anything that has to do with the world, but is secured in heaven and guaranteed by God himself. So when we take of the, from the Lord this bread uh, and then this cup of wine, we do so in the unfailing hope that God is on our side. He has loved us enough to secure our membership in his very family, and he will usher us safely into his presence when our mortal lives have reached their full number of days. And then finally, in all this, there's cause for joy. That's verse 11. Not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. All of us who have received that peace from God through Christ should be joyful people. And therefore, our remembrance of Jesus in the Lord's Supper should always be an occasion of joyful participation, which I know 
it is for all of you. So let us give thanks now uh, for the bread, remembering that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, he said, this is my body given for you. Father, we do thank you now for the bread, which is a reminder that uh, the Lord Jesus took upon himself a human nature, real flesh and blood, enduring the same uh, afflictions and trials that we've heard about uh, in our passage this morning, oh, and yet even more than we experience. Uh, he experienced the ultimate degree of, of trial and agony. Uh, this bread reminds us of that, given for us. Uh, he was obedient uh, even unto death, the death on the cross. So we rejoice in that today. Our hearts do exult in God as we partake now of this bread, and we ask, Lord, by your Spirit, that you enable us to do this in a way that is pleasing to you. For Christ's sake, amen. Mark quoted 1 John 4.10. I'm going to read that to you and speak briefly about it and reiterate some of the things that Mark has already spoken about. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. There's a lot of truth packed in that brief verse. It's about love. Volumes have been written on the subject of love. Countless poems and songs have been penned and sung about love. But here John wrote of God's love, pure love, selfless love, effective love. It is active and sacrificial and seen in the greatest expression of love at the cross of Christ where He became the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is an important word. You really can't understand what Christ did without understanding that word. Now, simply, it is, turn, it is turning away wrath by an offering. Today, that is not a popular word. In fact, you see this reflected in the Revised Standard Version's translation of this verse and other verses where it is used, where it is translated the expiation for our sins, meaning Christ removed our sins. He did. That is a truth, an important truth. But that word expiates out the idea of wrath. Because people today don't like to think of God as a wrathful God. But the Bible is clear. He is just and He punishes sin. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven Against all ungodliness, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. All ungodliness, whether it may seem to be a peccadillo to us or a great sin, all ungodliness is under the wrath of God. And it will be executed on all unbelievers in the last day. Christ delivered us from that. He is the, the sacrifice that satisfied God's justice and turned away His wrath because He bore it in our place, suffered for all of our sins as our substitute in judgment. And why did He do that? Because God loved us. Not because we loved Him. We didn't. We were estranged from Him. We were at war with Him. There was no love in us for Him when God chose us, and when He sent His Son to die for us. P.T. Forsyth described us as rebels taken with weapons in our hands. It's a good description of the natural man and what God has done for us. That's His love. We understand love for the lovely. We understand love for those who love us and those who do good to us. But love for enemies, implacable enemies, and that's true love. It's God's love for us. 
It saved us without cost to us, but at great cost to Him. Cost Him everything. That's what we remember in this supper and what we remember in the cup. So let's give thanks for the cup of wine that reminds us of the propitiation for our sins. Father, we do thank you for that. We thank you for your love for us, that you loved us not when we loved you before that. In fact, we love you only because you loved us. And we thank you for the great sacrifice the great, and the great demonstration of that love. But not just a, a demonstration, that sacrifice was the effective purchase of your people for you. You paid for all of our sins through the death of your son. May we remember that, reflect deeply upon that in this moment. We thank you for this cup that reminds us of what Christ poured out for us, of what he suffered for us, and the glorious results of it. Thank you for him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, that concludes our service again this Sunday, and let me just say it's so good to see so many of you here, good to see your faces again, and uh, hope to see you next week, and maybe some of those of you out there will see you next week too. Let's conclude with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, and a goodness that we can and will experience in the trials of life. And all of that goes back to the very thing we celebrated, your love for us as demonstrated and made effective in the cross of Christ. We thank you for his death for us. And we have the knowledge that <clears throat> we have a living Savior who is seated at your right hand, that you're in control and the triune God is guiding our lives and providing for us. We don't see it. We may not feel it. But that's the assurance we have from your promises. Help us to rely on your promises, to trust them, to not waver, and to live by faith, not by sight, day by day. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. May you run the race this week and do so by looking to Christ. We'll see you next week.